good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Good to be with you guys another day right here at the Council of Time. I know things are at the ignition point. Uh, they are igniting, aren't they? Tonight we're going to have a Q&A. I do have a few questions of you guys. And also, as usual, we may go a little off the rails. I hope that yesterday we hit on some points we can build from. I do. I really do. In order to continue to build with our Q&A, right, there are some answers. But all of us, we need those answers. But we need those by the most high. The world has its answers. And everybody should be clear right now who's running this earth. Who's running the world, right? So let's do this. First of all, I want you guys to note something. Hopefully you have forgiven everybody in your life. I hope you have. Everybody forgiven everybody. Hopefully you have. I'm asking this because the dogs are about to come out. And maybe not the dogs you're familiar with, but they're about to come out. Um, so hopefully you have forgiven everybody in your life. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody be a, a hangnail in your life, okay? To really forgive people, you have to realize what's going on. Let me ask you guys something. Is it really the person? Or is it the spirit behind the person? Think about that. Think about a person or people or a group or whatever that you have something against. Is it truly the person? Or is it the spirit behind the person? I'm going to read something to you guys. If you don't mind. I'm going to read it. And uh, let's see where it takes us. I'm going to read this because you know what? I, I... I have to admit to you guys, I have issues with uh, th this half-world doctrine in the Bible, I do. In other words, people have interpreted things to suit their own lives so they can be justified in what they're doing or in what they like to do. I don't like that. If the Word of God does not convict me, how can it be the Word of God? Right? I'm by no means equal with God, so that word should convict me, correct? It should never bolster anything that I, of the flesh, decide to do, but it should convict. And I look for that. And I thank God I've found that. From day one to this very day, I've found conviction, much conviction. But I want to read something to you guys. If you would, tolerate me here for a second. I'm going to read something. Here it is. And I saw an angel. This is Revelation 20. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Revelation 22. Revelation 22 is important. It's stating that an angel with the key to the bottomless pit locks up the devil. But listen, it says, because this is how you get to know what the dragon truly is. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Uh-oh, not the devil or Satan. The devil and Satan. You might want to write that down. That the dragon is indeed the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Now, the devil and Satan is what the Lord warned us against, fortifies us against. This is what we are contending with here on this earth. The devil and Satan. Not or. Not the devil or Satan, the devil and Satan. And this implies that we're dealing with two specific characteristics all the time. And this 
is what is working through people. This is what's coordinating the world against all measures of faith. This is corruption. We're going to go back to this, no doubt. But okay, so he, he, he bound him a thousand years. Now listen to this. Once he is bound, right? Once the dragon is bound. Somebody says, is Lucifer another one? The dragon is a, think of the dragon, right? Think of the dragon as a major spiritual kingdom. Think of that. And think of the devil and Satan as two motivations, two characteristics that many dark spirits carry. Think of it that way. So that when this dragon, right, the, the dragon is very important because it includes all the darkness. Right? It includes all the darkness. The motivation, the true motivation, the true source of wickedness is bound up here. Right? So that same wickedness, Lucifer is a part of. Neosabam is a part of. Azazel is a part of. Michael is a part of. Daniel is a part of, right? Um, all these different fallen angels are a part of this. But they're chained a thousand years. So that force is chained a thousand years. Now, listen, and it cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Now, remember, earlier in Revelation, the bottomless pit was opened. Now, the same angel who opened the bottomless pit, and this is, this is my belief, the angel with the key to the bottomless pit, I believe, is more of a warden. So when the bottomless pit is opened, that angel did so by mandate or directive from the Most High. That angel is not wicked. And so Apollyon, I believe, is in the bottomless pit with all those things. And when God's angel unlocks the bottomless pit, then they get out. That's the only way they can get out. They can't free themselves. But they're given instruction before they ever get out. They can't do everything. They're let out to do something very specific in which they take great pride, no doubt, in doing. Right? Um, but the same angel also, he, he, he binds up the dragon with chains and he throws him into the bottomless pit. And he casts him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now let me pause. That was Revelation 20, verse 3. So he's bound up a thousand years, and he does not deceive the nations anymore, which means right now he's deceiving the nations. Stay with me. He's deceiving the nations. So I'm going to be kind of blunt tonight. And please, please, no one get offended. If I happen to offend you, just ask me for clarification. That's all. Let's have a conversation about it. Instead of being offended, instead of uh, assuming, you may know the, 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 the um, origin of my conversation or the true motivation of it. Let's have a conversation about it. Open it up to the entire body here, right? So that we can reason with one another. Okay. Somebody says, please do, I'm confused about this subject. Well, that's what this subject is for. Because this is something that, for some reason, it seems like people cannot hold on to it. They forget it so fast. Right? Uh, so fast. To understand this, to know this, changes how you see the end times. It will change how you see times right now. It will change how you uh, operate in the world. It will give you great clarity in your walk. And most importantly, it will dethrone darkness in your life. It will dethrone it. So, folks, here we go. So this angel, this angel is very, very simple. The angel with the key to the bottomless pit lays hold of the dragon. He gets hold of the dragon. Right? And that, that's, so, that's incredible because one angel takes all of darkness Right? The devil and Satan and everything in between takes all of that and he throws it in the bottomless pit. In 
in the bottomless pit. A Pollyanna by Abaddon. Think of him as a, well, he could be a fallen angel. He's in the darkness. He's not one of God's angels that carries out his directives. He's a bad boy. Right? But, make no mistake, these fallen angels cannot do what they want to do. And that this is what people forget so much. They can't do what they want to do. They cannot. They can't. God created them, right? Don't you think God could pull the plug? But if God made them to be a specific way to have specific abilities, you better believe that your father can stop all abilities at a moment's notice. God doesn't have to try to fight any of them. With a thought, they would never exist. Hmm? He can speak peace and darkness will halt altogether. Never think he's out of control. God utilizes his creation to carry out his directives. He can do it himself. But make no mistake, God is pure. He's, he's a pure source. If God were to somehow appear right now, no doubt all of us would be consumed. Our process would not be finished. Right? Because his presence is pure. Darkness cannot stand in his presence and survive. Right? Remain the way it is. It has to be enabled to do that. Even us, we have to be purified before he returns. Without the blood of the Lamb, all of us would be consumed. All of us. So it takes your Father's blessing in the first place to even stand in his presence. Hmm? Okay. Now, follow me on this. So, He's bound up a thousand years. And he deceives the nations no more. That means at a sudden point, right, he won't deceive the nations at all. Now, upon him being bound, everybody has clarity. The confusion in your mind right now is because of him. These, these uh, inclinations we have towards sin is because of him. You know what the Lord was talking about a thousand year, a thousand years of peace, a thousand year reign? Satan is bound a thousand years that that may be accomplished. Think about that. Think about that. A thousand years where the world is peaceful because Satan is bound, which means a person has no inclination to do any evil thing. A person has no voices to be manipulated into doing something rotten, grotesque, or anything of iniquity. Everybody on earth has changed. Those of you who are faithful with the Most High, you will have changed at that point. You will rule and reign with Him. Those who, will, who were faithful with Him. But there will be human beings on this earth, but they will not be deceived by Satan. They will see miraculous things. For a thousand years. Isn't that awesome? No, this is not covered that much, is it? This thousand years. He's bound a thousand years. And on this earth will be, well, what many have talked about before. Now, but take note. So in order to establish peace on this earth, true peace, godly peace, listen to me, Satan can't be a part of that. He's not a part of that. He's bound. All his force his influence, right? His presence, everything is absent. It's done. Hmm? It's done. You know, a lot of people, they start thinking about this thousand-year reign, and they say, wait, wait a minute. Why would people live a thousand years? Now, I have to let you know something. I've read a lot of text. You guys know that. I've read a lot. The Lord had me read so much. So much. I've read several texts that talk about this thousand years. It gives explanation for the thousand years. Your father is truly kind. People right now, if this thousand year reign was not established, you would have people that would, uh, they would say, well, you know, I really didn't know. Well, if I would have, you know, if I could witness supernatural things, 
I would have, you know, I would have changed. I would have been different. And you met a lot of people would say that. Had they known it was real, they would not have, they wouldn't have did what they did. So I want you to think of something in one of those texts, and several of those texts actually, it says, during this thousand year reign, all those people who were all messed up, who did evil, start living on the earth in the presence of angels, in the presence of supernatural things, in the presence of peace, in the presence of a powerful kingdom here on this earth. But there's nothing but love and good and teachings and freedom and fulfillment and everything else. And they get to witness that. And they become a part of that. But something happens. When the thousand years is expired, those same people are easily deceived by Satan. And they turn totally against the living God. Those same people. The same people who said, if they would have been witnesses or knew that God was for real, that Christ was for real, that angels were for real, that the kingdom was for real, those same people, as soon as Satan is loosed, they're deceived again. Keep in mind the righteous are never deceived by Satan. But these are people of a different seed. They're on earth right now. Some of you are of that seed. That means there are some people who will never believe. They're among you right now. They're trying so hard to believe. But they're of a different origin. That origin is only revealed. And this takes place. And see, that way, no one has an excuse at the end. No one. No one will ever be able to say, the reason I was against God was because of this. They, they'll never be able to say, it was because they did not know. They'll never be able to say, it's because they, they, they couldn't bring themselves to actually believe this or that. They will live in the presence of it. When Satan is loosed, because darkness is truly in their origins, they go right back to their own source, which is darkness, and they fight against the living God. This is after witnessing a thousand years of miraculous things. That's an act of kindness. Do you know that? That's an act of kindness. See, because listen, what if God created all the angels, but nothing happened? And somebody asked Satan, hey, are you good or bad? He would say, I'm good. But in truth, he would not be good. Right? If you were there at the beginning of time, before Satan ever did anything, you could look Satan right in the face and say, you know what, you're, you're, you're messed up. He would say, how so? I've done nothing. I've done nothing. In fact, evil itself would say, I'm not evil. I've done nothing. So what did God do? What did God do? He gave everything the freedom of choice. And in that freedom of choice, people begin to exercise what they really are. He put us here on this earth without instant spiritual consequence, which means people get away with things left and right. Why did they do it in the first place? Because it conveys who they truly are. See, evil is not evil until it does something. That is evil. At the end, when the judgment comes, how can you judge a vessel who's never truly committed an evil, though they are evil? Hmm? How could you tell a demon, it's a terrible demon, if it never did anything against the light? So what did God do? We have an environment here of darkness and light. What does darkness do? Darkness will always target the light. You may not know this, but you exhibit A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. You are. You are the living examples of what darkness will do to vessels of light every single time. 
you are. Whatever darkness did to you, he did unto the Lord. Why? Because you're of the origin of the Most High. And through Christ, whatever's done to you is done against that kingdom of light. Do you see that? So that at the end, you are the proof that will stand there and say, this is what evil did. Evil did this and evil did that. Evil deceived me. Evil weakened me. Evil attacked me. Why do you think the Bible says that you will see? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You're going to see the judgment of the wicked. You're going to see the fall of the wicked. That you will judge the angels. Why? Because everything that's happened to you on this earth is happening through God's process. This is court. And life is the courtroom. You are evidence. You are. Those who are guilty, they were never guilty until you showed up. What about the righteous? When the righteous learn of righteousness, they always choose to get away from sin. See, there are some people out there that are stuck in sin. They're doing this, that, and the other. But I'm, let me tell you something, something I know. I know that anybody whose origin is truly of the Most High. They hate the sin that they do. They're not proud of their sin. That's why they have shame. Darkness has no shame. Hmm? They're not. You're trying to survive. You don't think your father knows that. And you've been doing things because that's all you knew how to do. In order to survive, you try to provide, and sometimes you did the wrong thing to do so. Your father knows that, but as you learn things, what do you do? You get away from darkness, because you do not like that darkness. You don't like that darkness working through you, most of all. You're not a person who points out everybody else's darkness. You're a person who's fleeing darkness yourself. You're refusing darkness to work through you. So when you see it, what do you do? What do you do when you see it? You say, uh uh, no more. No more. Every time you learn something is darkness, you sever it, you cut it off, you get rid of it. You will struggle to free yourself from it. The truth is, you don't want anything to do with it. You're not enjoying it. It causes shame. It takes away from your life. You know what it does. Your father knows what it does. But your life is evidence of who you belong to. Because darkness will never try to get away from darkness. Darkness is different. So never try to understand it. Why? Darkness is among the saints. And guess what it does? It uses every effort to act just like you. But it can't help but to do one thing. You ready? It will always justify darkness. Everything God said don't do, it will utilize scripture to justify why it had to do it. Your father's, Jesus said, do not judge. Darkness will justify why it should judge. You're not supposed to go around hurting people this, that, and the other. Darkness will justify by the word of God why they had to hurt somebody. That's what darkness does. utilizes scripture to fortify itself. And it will never talk about one subject. You know what that subject is? Darkness will never entertain the subject of forgiveness. It will not do it. Because if it ever said, hey, you should forgive, then it cannot judge anymore. See, if you forgive, you can't judge. If you forgive, you cannot accuse. And one of the major attributes of darkness, of a Satan or of a devil, is accusation. Well, guess what? If you forgive, there is no accusation, is there? So it never talks about accusation. Go back in your mind at all those people. All those people you found out that were cruel and evil, and yet they handled the word of God, were hurting people at the same time, abusing people, doing everything they could do. They justified judgment. They never spoke about forgiveness. They always spoke about the faults of another and tried to get everybody else to be a fault finder. A fault finder is an attribute 
of a devil. Do you know that? A fault finder will always find fault with somebody else. The Savior is not concerned about your faults. God knows every single fault we have, and he's not concerned about them. He's concerned about our salvation. How awesome is that? He knows every fault we have. He knows every foul thing in us. He's not interested in any of that. He's interested in our salvation. He did everything for our salvation, not for our damnation. Didn't he do it? Everything is constructed for salvation, not damnation. That's your Father in heaven. So children of the Father will share the heart of their daddy. So a person of the light is not interested in the darkness of a person. They're interested in the salvation of a person. And one big thing, they know their daddy is in charge. Darkness does not believe that. See, darkness handles everything itself and has no faith in the Most High. So it will do everything itself. But children of the Most High know they have a daddy who can do all things. And they leave things in his hands. They're never in a rush to harm anybody. Because they don't desire to harm anybody. That's why you have this issue when it comes to this end of the world stuff. And you say, well, wait a minute. i got to protect my family. Is it wrong to shoot someone if they come and try to shoot? See, these are questions that keep you up at night. Why? Because of your origins. A, a, a person of darkness would have no problem. You know what they say? Well, if anybody approaches, I'm going to kill them dead. It's their fault. A, a, a vessel of light's not going to say that. They're going to say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it wrong if I... See, they want to know, but why? It's conflict. They don't want to take a life. Evil does, but not the righteous. I have a scenario. What if a person was coming up to a house, and it indeed was the end of times, and they were crawling up to your house, tattered clothing, and somebody sees them and says, oh, they're trying to sneak up on us and rob us. And they shoot them. Then they go up to the person, oh, we caught you. And the person had no weapon or anything. And they said, I've, I've been starving for 30 days. And I used my last amount of energy to come and ask you, did you have anything? Hmm. That scenario is going to take place. It always does in times of combat. In fact, there are weird things that happen in those times. Do you know that there are some people who have encountered... This always happens during conflict. There are people who are hungry, people who are sick, who don't exist. In other words, there are hospitals who have taken care of people who never existed. There are people who have bought people in and, 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 and got them back to health, but found out they never existed. Those are God's angels. They're trying the process here on this earth. And they show up just like that. And how many people do you think will shoot God's messengers? The person won't even know they're being tried. And it's going to happen at a time, at the height of all confusion, at the wrong time. How many people would shoot one of God's messengers? Hmm? And yes, your father does things like that on purpose. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament, be careful when you entertain strangers because you entertain angels unaware. Better be cautious. Hmm? You don't know what process, how real this process is. A person who loves their father is always going to have the Holy Spirit, especially during a time like that. And that seed of love will always spark.
spark in the middle of combat. I thought that to be impossible one time. I'm telling you right now, it is not. That seed of love you have within you in the middle of a firefight can bloom out and it seems like everything stops and you can see everything so clearly and understand everything instantly. You'll know outcomes when nobody else does. You'll know exactly where to go and nobody has shown you a thing. You'll start praying at times that are inconvenient, yet your prayers will seem to take effect while you pray. sorts of things will begin to happen. Why? Because your father's word is true. You know who is a witness of these things? You are. You become a witness. A witness of your father's goodness. Of his resolve. Of his truth. I'll say it again. Once you're a witness, no one will be able to tamper with your faith. No one. So, let me, let me show you something here. We're not done with this. So, Satan is bound a thousand years. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, listen to this. It says, it says, and I saw the thrones. This is right after he's bound up a thousand years for that little season. It says, and I saw the thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Follow me. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Love that. Those who were faithful, even to the point of death. And I found out something, this, this statement that says beheaded, you need to do, you guys ought to look deeper into that. A lot of people think it means, oh, they're going to chop your head off with a guillotine. I found something different. I did. See, as it turns out, being beheaded does not always mean getting your head chopped off with a knife. Hmm? It can sometimes and often it means you being debilitated. Debilitated to the point where you're not able to function, you're not able to move, you're not able to do specific things. Isn't that exactly what the world is doing to you right now? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Ooh. So those who were faithful to the very end. I'll tell you something. If a person, I hear people say it all the time. Well, then I'm going to get my head chopped off because I will never take the mark of the beast. Yet those same people compromise right now in the middle of their trials. Do you not know that people are being beheaded right now and they still have their heads attached? If you're beheaded, your body no longer works. You're made immobile. You can't move. Isn't that what's happening to a lot of people here? If somebody takes your money away, you're made immobile. It's like being beheaded. Your body does not work. Does it? You can't go left. You can't go right. They take away your mobility. Tell you something. When the Lord says go deeper in something, go deeper. Go deeper. Not to go tell everybody else. Not to brag on it. Because I've never, ever said this before. That's mine. See, I have a lot of things that are mine. I'll never give them out. They're mine. The Lord gave them to me, just to me. And they're mine. When he says go deeper, go deeper. But you have a lot of people right now who are in fact being beheaded and they still have their heads attached. Yet their mobility is gone. They look at their own lives and they say, I can't do anything. Let me tell you something. Those found faithful until the very end are truly faithful. You give up in between. How can, a, how can that person be faithful? If you give in at any point, you're not going to be found to be faithful because you're not. 
be faithful is to be faithful all the way through, not halfway through. That's a commitment. And no one can commit themselves to something like that unless you have a seed within you that is real. In other words, this process is going to be finished for real, through real methods, real spiritual methods. No one is going to be able to fake the finish. No one. You will either finish authentically or you will not finish at all. Somebody said, I can't be as good as you, Mike, but I, no, 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 I'm not good. Your father's good. Don't look at me like I'm good. There's no comparison here. You, you think I'm better than you? Have you lost it? Have you lost it? You know who's better than me? The person who doesn't talk much. That's who's better than me. The person who has not handled the word of God to everybody else, that person is better than me. Every word I say, right? Every single word I say, every single concept I have, everything, it adds up. And don't think there's no penalty because there is. It's a burden and weights that are unimaginable. There are limits. God set many of you at liberty. He did. Enjoy that liberty. For those of you who want to be in the spotlight, your life is no longer your own. You cannot live like everybody else. You're bound by what you say. And if you ever cross what you say, then your father will deal with that in view of everyone. And goodbye to you. The penalties are stiff. They are. Just like it says in the Bible, don't be so quick to call yourself a teacher, knowing they're going to be judged seven times more harshly than anybody else. All these people who jump out there, who are trying to get the money for what they're doing, they have no idea what they're doing. This is dangerous to handle a holy word. Better to just tell somebody else to read it. No, don't call me good. Don't do that. Your father's good. The Lord is good. I am not. What I am, the father will declare soon enough. What we all are, the father will declare soon enough. And he gave that power to a son, so he will either say good and well done, my good and faithful servant. Or he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I don't have that final say. The Lord does. He will determine what I truly am. So I strive just like you do. And I'll never stop striving. All right, back to this. So, so, listen to this. Now, we're going to cover something, then I'll take a break. We're going to go back to it. And it says, Revelation 27, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four courts of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And when they went upon the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is God's direct intervention, the, the closing of prophecy, that declaration. That's why many people talk about Gog and Magog. The, the, the completion of Gog and Magog is right here. I'm reading it. The whole earth becomes Gog Magog. And it closes here when God himself devours all who set themselves against that holy place. God consumes them all. Listen, and after this, 
It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I'm pointing out here is this, something I want you to see. When Satan is bound a thousand years, there's no iniquity. There's no sin. But when Satan is loosed, it's back just that quick. When you look at the people of this earth, never forget something is influencing people to do evil. Now, a person can agree with it. A person can just slowly walk into it, get trapped into it for whatever reason. But make no mistake, it is authored by Satan himself, not the person. When Satan is bound a thousand years, no one will be like they are now. If Satan were bound right now, the influence of darkness would be gone. No one would have a desire to deceive another. No one would walk around with greed in their heart. No one would walk around with murder in their hearts. These things that rest in the hearts of men are from spirits. In fact, you'd see people stop. No doubt they would begin to cry. They would understand what they did. And they'd be deeply regretful for it. But here's the problem. If you belong to darkness, when your source returns, you become what the source is. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? In other words, just like Jesus said, there's a principle upon all of us. You ready? The will of your father, you will do. Whoever your father is, you will do the will of. That's a heavy one, I know. But nevertheless, Jesus said that. The will of your father, you will do. So whoever your true father is, that's what you're doing the will of. For those whose father is the devil, they are murderers. They're the ones who go around hating everybody. They're the ones who are sowing seeds of discord and everything, just like the Lord explained in the Old Testament. But for those who are the children of the Most High, they're so convicted. They're so torn. They see life, and they see how people live it. But there's something in them calling them to a higher level all the time. They walk around with conviction. They have conflict within them because they're in the flesh. They desire to do holy things, often not meeting the mark. It's not a happy place for them. Love is their joy, and they know the world fights true love. They know that. But one day, the source of the children, it will show up. And at that point, it's over for darkness. You do know that, don't you? Healing is in his wings. His reward is with him. And he will come. We are to prepare for this time. We are. When he comes, our completion is here. When he comes. Isn't that awesome? So make no mistake in the world. If they didn't have Satan as an influence, people would be totally different. When you know that, it's very easy to forgive. It's like a person who loses their memory. Like that mobster. There are a few people who did some bad things. They lost their memory and all of a sudden they were good people. Do you know, I, I, it's something like two or three hundred people who have died peacefully, good people in their communities. Because they lost their memory of who they were. And who they were before that was they were horrible people. Evil people. But they lost their memory and became somebody totally different. Do you know that? Just by a memory, just by memory loss. When somebody wipes out your past, your influences and everything else, you become different. These people became peaceful and everything else. See, Satan sows, he, he will sow seeds early in life. For all of you, he tried to mess you up. 
He did. He tried to really mess you up, right? You may have the sting of your past, but it's time for you to understand what your past truly was. Come to terms with it. Realize exactly what it was. Hmm? He did. But without your past, if you could not remember anything of your past, you'd be a different person. You would. You would be a totally different person. So then the Bible is true when it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and all this other evil stuff. That's what we wrestle against. And take note that these dark forces, they began sowing seeds in people's lives from the beginning. From the beginning. You can remember that. You'll see people differently. And I look at people in all honesty because they still yet live here on this earth. They too have an opportunity. And when a person is totally given into darkness, yet they're given an opportunity to have life because I know the penalty for those who have truly said no to Jesus. I know what the penalty is. I know what it is. Which means those who are walking around, many of them are at the gates of hell. They are truly Delusion, not given totally over. See, when a person is given totally over, when a person is totally condemned, they're not going to have life, just so you know that. The only, the only negation to that would be the kingdom of the beast. That'd be a negation. In other words, those at the end times who are of a true darkness are going to join themselves to the kingdom of the beast. Not by mistake, but by pride. They will truly belong to that source of darkness. And that source of darkness is going to be, is going to avail itself on the earth. The process has already begun. The rise of the kingdom has already begun. So darkness is truly rising and more and more people are joining it. More and more joining it. This is part of the sadness of the end times. Because many of you will, you'll see people give themselves over to it. They'll believe in it. They'll go straight to it and they'll say, wait a minute, what are you doing? But they won't hear you. They won't hear you. Don't be disheartened too much. See, this is that time when the Lord said, when the Lord said, be watchful of what you're doing. Those who lead someone into captivity, they themselves will go into captivity. Those who kill with the sword will be killed with the sword. That's an instant reaping of what you have sown. That's the time you're in. It's time you're in right now. You're soon about to learn that somebody may be your sibling biologically, but spiritually, you can be total opposites. Only through this end times event can that be revealed. Otherwise, you'll know it at the very end. Still, the Lord is quite clear. We don't know the end result right now to anybody's life. We don't. We do not. That's why your Lord said, love your enemy. Don't worry. They're, they're going to separate themselves from you soon enough. You'll never have to point at them. They will run from you. And that's coming. But the Lord gave us a warning. All ye meek of the earth who have wrought his judgment in the earth, hide yourself within him, the Most High. Hide yourselves. You know what that means? Totally immerse yourselves in holiness during this time. you don't want to be found in the darkness. You do not want to be found giving the wrong things in the wrong season. Because your Lord, he will return. And woe unto the person who is found damaging his fellow man during that time. 
whether you hate a person, whether you can't forgive a person, woe unto that person, because you're going to be found iniquitous. And the Lord of that servant is going to return in an hour. He's not looking for them. And the end result of that person, they're going to go with his weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many will be found hypocrites. Their judgment will be swift. Many are going to be moved out of the way. That means a lot of people are going to leave this earth. Many will be set free. But the stakes are going to be much higher. Much, much higher. Take note of that. But most importantly, before I take this break, take note. People, they work darkness and do these iniquitous things in the earth. Because of the darkness and the spiritual darkness in this earth. God already gave you power to do something about that. Most people opt not to do anything about it. But the Lord never said join in with the world to cast blame on somebody else. And I'm so glad that someone heard something and made a change in their tone. They knew what I'm talking about. See, that's the way, not the other way. The world will demand of you to be a vessel of darkness. You will not prosper listening to the worlds and making the demands of the world. Listen to your father. He made no mistake in the course of action regarding your life. That was no mistake. To be openly spared was no mistake. But I say it again. The darkness will always be all around you, fighting. Fighting for your very soul. Choose righteousness. Choose righteousness. Be willing to lose everything you have and everything in your life for the Lord's sake and you'll find that you'll lose nothing. It is his restoration. That's the joy you're missing. The world's restoration will always leave just as quick as it came, but the Lord's restoration is eternal. Be back in a few minutes right here at the Council of Time. Okay. And we are back. Okay, you guys can hear me good. All righty. Questions. Somebody said, somebody says, Mike is quickened and a new birth. Is, well, quickened. Think of it this way. And that that's a word that ties into a, a method, actually, to be quickened. Like the word says, we were quickened together with Christ, right? He did that for us. Quicken is to be rebuilt. To be born again is to have a brand new identity. To be born again, okay, to be quickened. It's different. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully. Why was sin allowed to proliferate under the law before Jesus finally came? Well, all of it was a process. I think the law was given to a people who were somewhat law. They had no direction. So the law was given to remind them of unrighteousness. Right? That's exactly what the word says. Now, the law was given, but man could not keep that. Life is a process. God doesn't control us. He doesn't control us. So when, you're, when you have something that you do not control, you give it an opportunity. Correct? So the law was given to remind mankind of their sin. Once they became aware of their sin, a truly a burden started. But all of it was part of a process, an important process. Then we get up to the point of Christ. Right? Many who found out they could not keep the law, hear me on this, they couldn't keep the law, they were disheartened by that. 
We think of a person who tried their best to stay within the law. They just think of that. But a person who continued to fall short, they had no, uh, they had no hope. It was hopelessness. You know that people took full advantage of that. But then a Savior comes. And he truly is a Savior to the hopeless, isn't he? He truly is a Savior to the hopeless. And there were truly hopeless people back then. So what happens when you give hope to the hopeless? Fulfillment. You get fulfillment. You get people who go above and beyond born in their belief and become extraordinary. You have people of whom that faith is built up so much because if you believed, but then you knew you could not meet the mark, which is where many people were, how hopeless of a life that would be. How hopeless. To strive and, and fall and, and you couldn't meet the mark. Right? And then, of course, men took full advantage of that. There's a big lesson in that. But when Christ came, the hope level was so high, it spread like wildfire. It was so much hope that we have that word today. Isn't that awesome? It was so much hope that us Gentiles have that word and we receive it today. That's an awesome thing, isn't it? That, in fact, Christianity has never it's been a flame no one could ever put out. It spread all throughout the world. All because of that process. God doesn't control us. He granted us opportunity. He showed us our guilt. He showed us what we were unable to do. He showed us what darkness truly did to us. And when he showed us that, for those who learned that darkness did that to us, we see the opportunity in salvation. We see the gift of salvation. We see that we did not deserve it. We don't deserve life. We don't deserve anything good. We truly deserve death. But instead of death, a loving God gave us life. He truly defined himself to us through that act also. And it's open for all men to receive. Beautiful thing. That's why. So you have a lot of people on this earth, right? They do some crazy things. Let me share this with you. Again, there are people out there who do terrible things. They're not fully condemned yet. They're not, they're not, they're not. There are people in COT who were born in Masonic families. Rich, rich, rich families. Masonic families. Of whom the Lord laid his hand upon and they were pulled out of that whole thing. And these are folks that were dedicated to Satan. But guess what? Now they know about the whole thing. But the gig is up. Satan has been found to be powerless. How awesome is that? That's why you don't count people out. I know people of whom a, uh, some sort of ceremony was given to them at birth. But the Lord saved them. Let me tell you something. There's still hope. That's why I don't go out damning anybody. I don't count anybody out. Now, each person has to work out their own salvation. But if the Lord opens a door for an opportunity for me to assist a person, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I don't operate like normal people say, well, that person's counted out. Because let me tell you something. All of you could have counted me out in my early days. You count me out right now, if not for Christ. And then wouldn't you know what? Those people end up being the greatest asset to the kingdom. Do you know why? Because they know what darkness truly is. Darkness can no longer fool them. They can't. Once you've been born in the devil's house, and the Lord frees you from the devil's house. You know how the devil runs his house. And he may fool everybody else, but he's not going to fool the vessel who grew up in that house. Once you know his ways, you become a danger to his entire operation. And that person can stand up and warn others. That person can stand in a confidence that hardly anybody else can. That person is going to have faith that's going to be off the chain. Why? Because they know who the devil is. And they're not going to fall for his tricks. That person's going to stand through the most terrible times. Why? Because they know the devil's tricks. 
So you have a lot of people condemning folks because they believe in this TV stuff. Mm-mm. Believe in the word. Mm-mm. Believe in the word. Somebody says, Michael, if, if sins against children is so rampant in the world, controlling the governments, at least, how should we pray for the children? It breaks, pray for the children. Listen, God didn't ask us to come up with a solution. God told us to seek his face. Didn't he? Thank you, Lord. See, it's not up to us to come up with some solution. It's up to him to do that. Hear me out, because everything he's allowing and everything he does is important. We may not know how all the time, but you better believe it has to do with salvation. Some of the most tasteless things you can see on this earth, God has allowed for reason. We don't know that reason. But I'll tell you something. I know people who have gone through some horrible things as children. Right now, they're more powerful than you can imagine because of their childhood. They cannot be fooled like the average person because of their childhood. That same person that was stuck like Chuck, the same person of whom no one came to rescue. They grew up, Satan lost, and that person knows exactly what that demonic entity looks like. That person knows exactly how that spirit operates. They can see it when nobody else can. They can point it out when nobody else can. They can see an operation when nobody else can. And that person, they can pray. The Lord break the bonds of that thing that they see when nobody else will ever pray for it because nobody else can ever see it. Hmm? That person can have mercy upon vessels that nobody else can muster. Why? Because they know what that person is going through and everybody else is blind to it. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. All things of purpose. We often do not understand. And when we pray, seek his face, the Lord has the solution, not us. But if we see something and we're moved to pray, then pray. Remember something, the Lord never told you to come up with the solution. But he did tell you to seek his face. Seek him out, because that's an act of faith. Do you know that? To seek him out is an act of faith. To seek something out that, that, that nobody else can see is an act of faith. Now you're operating in faith. It pleases God. When you operate in faith, and in turn his word is true upon that prayer and your life, and the intercession is real upon the lives of those you prayed for. See that? See how that works? See, sometimes people have made it, they've complicated things so much, they truly, lots of people truly believe that somehow they got to come up with the answer. No, that's not what the Lord said. People do that to be the the go-to person. If a person just simply said, Lord, this thing I see is, is hurting me. Lord, please do something about it. And if that person, that's all you pray? I'm telling you, that's a powerful prayer. You know why? It's real. It's real. You're a reminder to everything that that thing is happening. You know, the worst thing that could ever happen is if we see a thing and never pray about it. When you pray for things like that, you're expressing the power of the kingdom, the continuity of the kingdom. You're shining your light. That little prayer that people would say, well, that's not a powerful prayer at all, would be the most powerful prayer a man could ever pray. Hmm? You're a vessel of the kingdom of the living God. Never forget that. Everywhere you go, you bring the kingdom with you. Everywhere you go. So guess what? Release the powers of the kingdom upon the darkness of this world. And see the salvation of the Lord. He never told us to come up with a solution. He told us to seek his face. He already knows what he's going to do. He wants you to be included in what he's doing. That's awesome, isn't it? He wants you to be a part of his deliverance of this world. That's awesome, isn't it? So when you pray, you're effectively a part of the deliverance of this world. You're a citizen of a powerful kingdom, an everlasting kingdom. 
And things are happening, my friend. Things are happening. Come on, guys, put the questions. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. That's why, yeah, listen, that's why the, the father is so awesome. You know, I learned a long time ago when, um, when I was trying to resolve the right tactic for things. I found out a long time ago that God already has a solution. But he desires that we be a part of that solution. To be a part of the body. He truly desires to work through his body. His appointed body on the earth, that you and I. So I always say I want to be a vessel of usage. Right? I want the Lord to use me. Based on what he wants to use me for. Not based on what I want to be used for. I do not request, right? That, Lord, I want to work in that field only over there. I don't do that. No. I truly mean it when I say, Lord, use me in whatever capacity you can. I want to be used. I do not want to be useless. I really don't want to be. I don't want my life built up. And, 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 but I'm, and I'm not used for his work. No, forget about that, too. I don't want to gain anything outside of the Father's will. Because all that's going to do is foster a life outside of my father. I don't want that. And for me, all that goes back to the cross. Let me make something clear with you guys. You ready for this? Just so everybody knows, everybody knows about the belief thing. Here, listen. To believe in something, right? To believe in something, if you believe in something, you also want to be a part of it. I believe in Christ. I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. As for everything else, I do not believe in. That, that, that's pretty simple. I don't believe in anything else. Because everything else is just a some sort of method. A made-up method of mankind, right? I do believe in Christ. I do. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Mike, do you believe in the rapture? I said, no, I believe in Christ. But I know something like the rapture is going to happen according to Thessalonians. But I believe in Christ. Somebody asked me, do you believe in the 144,000? No, I don't believe in them. I believe in Christ. That's why I believe in Christ. Get it? I know things are true. I don't believe in them, though. I believe in Christ. To believe in something is to follow something, right? Is to carry something. I don't. I don't. I don't go around worshiping the rapture. I don't go around worshiping the hundred forty-four thousand. No. The good news is not the hundred forty-four thousand. The good news is not the rapture. The good news is Christ. We can be forgiven. Repentance, the sacrifice, redeemed Lord who's alive and well. Hmm? That we can be put back in our position again. That someone paid the price for our sins. Never forget you're bought with a price, a high price. You know what the price was? The life of the Son of the living God. That's the highest price God could have ever paid. For you and I. That's why when people say, well, what denomination are you? I'm a believer in Christ. That's my denomination. I know there are other things out there. I don't condemn what people are a part of. It's just me, myself. I'm a believer in Christ. Period. Mike, would you know why many of us are going through more things physically as in pain and uncomfortable? I'm complaining about it, but it just seems to be happening frequently. I pressure migraines behind the right hand. Those things will increase. The body, Abraham went blind, didn't he? Abraham went blind. Moses was starting to get a little senile. You know, things happen to the body. The body degrades. 
Our bodies are not promised to live forever. Right? These are simple challenges. You know what happens with every deficiency in my body? I become thankful for the times there was no deficiency. Do you know that? I go through a lot. I do, physically. But it's not something I am. I, I never really talk about it. But I go through a lot. But I'm, it always makes me thankful of all the times where there was no pain in that area. I'm thankful of the times I had good feeling in my fingers and everything else. I'm always thankful for that. And it causes me to end up in this praise moment. And I start remembering all the years, dis despite my activities, how blessed I was. So the body is, we're not promised to be in this perfected health. The body is going to go through its processes. The body is going to return to the earth. Right? But, but, but let me tell you something. Your faith, your relationship with Christ, he can offset all these failures of the body. He can offset it. He really can. See, at some point, a lot of people are going to get to the point where they don't like their discomforts. And one day, you know what they're going to say? This, huh? Now, if, if I'm going to have healing, it's going to be real or not. But, I'm, Lord, I'm, listen, my belief is in you, and I'm, I'm going all the way in you. Because I know this, if any one of you were to step fully in the will of God, you're going to have a physical change in your body. Let me give you the most important thing. You ready? Here it is. If God were to heal your body, if you were to heal your body, will that enhance your relationship with Christ? Before you answer, because if it will, you don't need a healing. If it takes the healing of your body to enhance your relationship with Christ, you don't need that healing. That means you would serve Christ even more only after he does something favorable to you. Which means all we all know how it works. If your body's healed, that's going to last for a little while, and then you're going to need something more, and then something more, and then something more. That's why it's a wicked generation that seeks for a sign. Because if a sign is given... We have such an insatiable appetite for proof that we're going to need something down the road to believe again and again and again. Hmm? Case in point, how many people ever got upset because they did not receive something they asked for in prayer? When you did not receive it, you slumped. You slumped. You said, oh, I didn't get it. Well, maybe it's something I'm doing. To oh, why are you doing that? Why? Well, maybe the Lord didn't want to give it to you at that time. See, a lot of people, they, they rate their relationship based upon what they receive, what they have, how they look, this, that, and the other. That, that, that house holds no bearing on your relationship with Christ. Now, think of a person who does not, who's not asking for anything. They simply want to obey the Lord. I tell you right now, that person who wants to obey the Lord doesn't have to ask for anything. But as they seek to walk in the will of God, they're going to be healed that they may walk in the will of God. Here's, here's the big mystery. If it takes you to have operational legs to walk in the will of God, you're going to have operational legs. If it takes you to have full usage of your mental faculties, then you're going to have full use of your mental faculties. If you have to have good lungs, right, to fulfill the will of God in your life as you walk in His will, you're going to have good lungs. So the key to healing is to align yourself with His will. And everything you ever needed is in His will for your life. It is not in our path we make for our own lives. It's in the will of God. Why would God, what, now let me ask you something. Why would God improve me if I'm walking in a different path than what he desires me to walk in that's going to bring me to that ultimate place of absolute salvation? Why would God add anything to me for doing my own thing? I do not want that. I asked the Lord a long time ago, when I get off the path, Lord, I need to be stripped. I do. I need to be stripped. So it's a reminder for me I'm on the wrong path because otherwise, I told the Lord, otherwise I'm not going to know. I do not want to be healed. I do not want to be increased outside of his will because all that's going to do is foster a walk outside of his will. That's when I was expressing my heart's desire with the Lord. And the problems I had, you know what the problem is? When you can, um, when you have skill sets and you can enhance your own life and this, that, and the other, you can walk in all sorts of paths and then claim they're from the Lord. 
until the day all that evaporates. I don't want that. I, I really want to walk in the will of God. So therefore, I do not want to be prosperous outside of the will of God. I don't want that. I do not. I don't want it. I told the Lord one time, no matter how much I cry, to be fixed, repaired, Lord, don't give it to me. Don't give it to me until I seek your will again. Please don't, because I'll be destroyed if that happens. See, that's when you know yourself. That's when you really know yourself. When it says, Michael, what are your thoughts on fasting? Fasting is real. But I believe that fasting should be under the direction of the most high. That's what I believe. And he gives that direction sometimes. Fasting, is, if you look up that tradition of fasting, right? Fasting is, in fact, a sacrifice. Do you know that? It's your sacrifice. It's what you're willing to do, right, for a purpose. So when you fast, because I looked up the original fasts, and they were so, they were very concise, right? But it was giving up something, giving up all these desires and giving up all these uh, uh, things that we ingest and take in to supply ourselves. Because often God would say, fast seven days, and then after you fast, I will give you this word. I'll give you this word. I'll tell you what this is about, right? And we'll come to find out that fast, in that fast, when it was directed by the living God, they never got hungry. They never got thirsty. They never did. Right? Now, there were certain fasts that the Lord called people on, and it exposes things. And let me tell you something about a fast. When you're weakened in the body, you're doing so for the sake of the Lord. You go through a lot of pain and everything else. Right? Because you, you start, you know, your body will start eating itself. But while it's doing that, your spirit rises up within you over your flesh, and it will shut your flesh totally down. In other words, you know how your flesh desires things at the wrong time? You won't have that problem anymore. In fact, even now, I don't yield to my body. I can't do that. If I get hungry, I don't eat. I appoint a time to eat, right? But I will not eat based off hunger. I won't do that. Because I've noticed when, when, when a person does that, they'll, they give in to the demands of the body. No, nope, that's not going to happen with me. When the body is under my submission. As I follow the Lord, so the body is submitted to that walk. That's why I'll never be overweight. Because I do not eat based upon the hunger of this body. I determine that time. Right? And I found in by doing so, it really qualifies your commitment in certain things. See, if you get hungry and you're thirsting, you're falling apart at the seams physically, you're really going to find out what your faith level is, if you're doing something for real or not. But when you say, no, this is what's determined, I'm going to see it through until the end, and you don't care if your body folds in, collapses, or dies, but that you will follow through with your commitment to the Most High, that's a different thing. Because you'll have to face that, right? It, it causes a person to be very truthful in what they submit to the Lord. It does. It does. It actually does. God, used, God, set, this, God set that in motion. The Lord set that in motion based upon his decree. Men initialize that based on their honor of the Most High. That was based on honor. Honor. Based on their faith. And it was directed spiritually. So, anyway. That anything you do, listen, anything you do, I never, I'm never a copycat of somebody else's stuff. I need to know what the, how the, when did the Lord install this into the process of life? See, I have to know what the Lord said about things. I don't want to know what people said about it. I want to know what the Lord said about it. 
always go back. As long as we can get to the origin of a thing, I can do it. Otherwise, I can't do it because it will be disingenuous of me. Some people have, uh, um, some people have, have done things that are somewhat disingenuous, right? Based off people, I can't do that. I have the worst conviction because if it's not of my father, I don't want to do it. I don't, especially something like that. Because if I do fast, right, it's going to be the process I go through based off my commitment to whatever I'm, you know, whatever that uh, interaction is with the Most High. It's going to be based on nothing but commitment and truth. It's not going to be for show. It's not going to be for many of the reasons most people think. It's going to be real. It's going to be real. That's why I hardly, when I go through personal fasts, I don't, I never mention them. I never mention those times. Do I, do I, do I accept that they're real? Oh, yes. You better believe it. You better believe it. But again, again, I believe it's something that requires direction from the Lord. It really does. So it's good to look into those things to see how they began, you know, what was in it, this, that, and the other. It's a very good thing. Two thousand three hundred days. Well, in the context, of, I'll tell you something about Daniel. Daniel is such a people have gone through the Daniel timeline in an attempt to be right. Let me ask you something: Why? Why would anybody want to be right about the timeline in Daniel? Can somebody answer that question for me? Why would anybody want to be right? For what reason? Here's what I know. If a person set out to get the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, right? Why would they do that? Why? Well, some out of curiosity, some for this and some for that. Did the Lord ever make it a mandate for us to have the dimensions of the New Jerusalem? Why would he do that? When the Lord does something, is for a is for a very high reason, right? A lot of people do things out of curiosity. They do. I'm always purposed behind what I'm attempting to do. There's always a purpose behind it, always. But never will that purpose ever be to have something nobody else has, to present something nobody else did, right? These times in the book of Daniel. I did something with those times. One time I did this. Just one time. And it kind of blew me away. But I never shared it with anybody. I never did. I found something. The time in Daniel matches all time. Then it matches prophetic times. On a microcosm and a macrocosm. At the exact same time. It covers all time and it covers a small time at the exact same time without error. I've never seen that before. Never. When I found that out, and, and when I, because see, my hunt, when I was, when I did this, that was after prayer. Because I said, Lord, what are you talking about? This 70 weeks. 70 weeks have been decreed from going forth. The man has rebuilt Israel to come as the Messiah, the Prince, and all these different things in between. I said, well, what is that? Why is that important? So the Lord sent me on a short journey. And that's when I learned out about the sabbatical weeks. That's when I found out about the four calendars. That's when I saw the macro and micro time in it. That's when I saw it. That's when I saw the incidents and how it named what already took place, how it names what will take place. That's when I saw the spiritual sabbatical week. That's when I learned some things from the Hebrews, some things from the Jews. That's when I saw some certain original calendars and some of the disputed calendars that were brought back from Babylon that were mingled in with the dates that they use today. Even some of the arguments they still have in Jerusalem right now concerning the days of God. So when it comes to those things, I'll never get into making a, a chart for everybody so they can believe my timeline. No, I, don't know, I can't do that. 
won't ever do that. What I will do is encourage any and everybody to simply seek the Lord, especially in those timelines, and allow the Lord to lead you to his truth. Because you have a choice. You can have man's truth. You can have a scholar's truth. Or you can have your father's truth. And it will relate to your life. It's impossible. Nobody can just throw numbers in there like that's impossible. It applies to your life. It applies to every human being on earth throughout the course of their life. And that's impossible to do. It really is impossible to do. But but please just take note, just take note though. In in other areas, right, the Lord has never had me go into those areas. So it doesn't mean I know everything. It just means that those areas the Lord led me to. He's given me instruction behind. Some things I share, some things I do not. But if you would ask your father, out of sincerity, he will not withhold that knowledge from you. He won't. He won't. He won't. He'll guide you into that truth. And you too will be a witness of his goodness. Of his goodness from the beginning. You will. That's why a lot of people have deduced what they discuss these days. You know that, right? They have deduced certain subjects they talk about that I do not talk about here in COT. Anything that mankind has made popular, I do not discuss. Because they made that popular. And the Lord spoke of something very different from that. So, I don't talk about those subjects that are popular to most people. Better believe by most people, right? Because I see where it came from. And I can't perpetuate those things. Can't do that. Deduced. That's when you take something and you just, you know, you break it down into fractals or small parts. And you say, well, it must be this and it must be that. So something you, a, a person has calculated or come up with or they quantified or, or some conclusion they have come to based upon all the evidence presented. Like logical deductions in your, in your uh, uh, communications classes, you know, things like that. So there we are with that. I hope it kind of answers that because that's why I don't go into those things. That's exactly why I don't go into those things. Mike, do you think according to macro, macro and micro that God operates like kind of the, what is that? Like electric board and a computer? No, not really. No, not at all. No. Somebody says, Mike, do you think according to the macro and micro that God operates Kind of like uh, um, kind of like the universe is like an electric board and a computer. No, not at all. I don't think that 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 would be linear. Right? I do not think God operates linear. Here's what I believe. I believe that God is in the beginning right now. Right? That God is in our time right now, and that God is at the end right now. How about that? I believe God operates out of the time bubble we're stuck in. God gave. He already told us why he. Gave us time, and many people don't know that. You know that's in the King James Version of the Bible, what time is. Time is given so mankind can reflect upon his life. Otherwise, mankind could not reflect. Everything would be at one time, right? So he gave that so mankind could reflect. Do you know that's in the King James Version of the Bible? It is amazing what's in the King James Version of the Bible. It is truly amazing. These subjects, right? That are just simply not discussed. It's an amazing thing. But he gave us that so we could reflect. It's not for him. All of what we live in, all of what we live by, is created by the living God. We are not creators. The Father is. We exist within what he created for us. He did that for us. Man just has a habit of trying to interpret the world in an interesting way so they can so they can add meaning to their life. Many people don't have meaning to their life, believe it or not. And the smarter a person is, the less meaning to life they're going to extract. 
because they see the fallacy of mankind, which runs in a circle and goes into nothingness. And so a lot of smart people you're going to find, you'll, you can ask them and they'll say, no, I really didn't see a point to life. It, I had to go on a journey to find meaning for life. They were empty. They were devoid because they had such comprehension. But they only had comprehension of what mankind did and mankind's interpretation. And they were absent in the spiritual things which actually grant life. Right? Men come up with interesting things, but only to those people who desire to look into them. A lot of things of this world are empty to me, not because I'm smart, because I'm able to recognize what man is doing. Man is cruel at his root. He's very cruel. Very cruel. I say, you know, a dragon is behind many things. Even the best acts of people can be damaging to those they don't know. That's what happens when you operate in the framework that man has invented or mankind thinks he invented. I desire to see outside of that. I don't, join in, I don't think the same about politics like everybody else. I don't join into arguments like everybody else. I do believe in the Word of God. The Word of God is so incredibly pure. But even it says that has to be understood spiritually. Spiritual. All right, next question. Come on, guys. Give me, give me a, give me one of those taboo ones. Someone. I see Angela in there, but I see no question. Huh. Somebody says, "What?" Oh, somebody says, "Would it be wrong to know extra biblical writings where you got the additional information regarding thousand years?" No, that wouldn't be wrong. But seek the Lord for those things. Here, here's why you seek the Lord, right? For example, the Book of Enoch. There are there are lots of versions of the Book of Enoch, and if you've read, uh, I've read four versions, right? And there are some missing parts in the original version. Well, they fill them in with the other versions. Where they get that from? They as, as an assumption. They threw that assumption in there. And it's not like the average person is going to read the whole thing to evaluate it. And so, you know, I'm stuck on kind of one version. I don't like the assumptions. I don't. They throw the assumptions in there. And so the newer texts often have these assumptive qualities that get away from the original text in the first place. If it's blank or if it, they can never decipher it, then don't decipher it. You know, but don't add anything to it. If you add or take away to any type of a document, it is no longer that document. Right? It's like telling somebody something. You, hey, go tell that person uh, I'm going to meet them at 2 p.m., but I'm coming from the east side. And, and so you go up to them and say, well, listen, somewhere around 2 p.m. over there on the east, you know, he's going to meet her, Okay. Well, you just, you know, that person just messed up the whole thing because they thought they knew what the person was talking about, but in truth, they did not. And they messed up the whole meeting place. So if you alter things, you can only alter things based on the assumption you know with perfection what the other person intended to communicate. Well, it just so happens that if something is communicated spiritually, then logical determinations, assumptions, filling in the blanks, it's not going to work. It just won't work. It won't work at all. Similar thing, can you explain how to put on the armor of God daily? It is simply to center yourself and your Savior daily and to think about the elements of that armor daily. Right? Listen, the armor of God is not your armor. It's God's armor. So in order to truly don or put on the armor, wouldn't you have to center yourself within the Creator every day of your life? Which is to simply say, be mindful of your Savior every single day. Be mindful of that sacrifice every single day. Be mindful of the day that's given to you. Right? That this brand new opportunity called a day that the Lord has made. Right? 
Don't blindly be glad and rejoice in it for what? That's like a person told me one time, they said, I thank God he woke me up this morning. And I, I used to hear that a lot, right? And I did not agree with it. Let me tell you why I didn't agree with it. Why would I thank God for waking me up? And then that's it? No, that's incomplete. I'm not going to thank God that, that's going to wake me up, give me another day so I can do what I want to do and go out and defile the day just like I did the day prior. No. I thank God for waking me up this day because it gives me another opportunity to get right what I couldn't get right the day prior. See, I have to have a reason for these things. I'm, I'm not going to thank God for my stuff, for waking me up so I can do what I want to do. I'm not going to thank him for that. Because I'm not living like that. That's incomplete to me. That, that's uh, selfish or something. But that's how people are. They'll say, well, thank you, Lord, for giving me this, this time so I can do what I want to do. And in truth, that's, isn't that what people are saying? I don't agree with that. Every day we're given is an opportunity. It is highly purposed. It is a gift. It truly is a gift. And I know the Lord does not give me extra days so I can do what I want to do. No. But each day is an opportunity. Another day to get it right. Hmm? Another day to communicate something much better. Another day to serve him well or completely. It's another opportunity. And I won't waste it on the stuff I want. That to me is foolishness. To, just to me, you can do what you like. But that's crazy. That's foolishness to me. Because I see too much of that in the world. People haphazardly living their life and hurting people along the way. Thinking something is harmless. Look at our society. Isn't our society a consequence of what we thought was harmless? And look at it. Look how evil our society has gotten. Look how immoral it's gotten. I can't stand cursing, right? And when you hear kids curse, it makes you cringe. I'm not going to send them to the pit. Here's the problem with that. When a kid curses, they have adopted something. Truly from flesh, the exercise, these sayings of flesh, not understanding what they are, that when they speak, the words you speak are aligning themselves with a kingdom. What are your words performing for? See, in truth, there is no idle word. It's only idle to the person that thinks it's not doing anything. Oh, no, it's doing something. It could be supporting something the person never sees. But this, uh, these ways of men that nobody thinks is harmful, that's why our society is the way it is. Look at how many things we thought were harmless, and yet they changed policy of the world. That's why we have such a crooked world, because people thought things were harmless. And when they get themselves, these harmless things are like ticks. And once that tick gets embedded, you cannot get it out. And it degrades everything. These small things. Satan never jumps out and says, boo, I'm Satan. Satan starts everything in these tiny, insignificant ways. And every time we start overlooking the small things, we're overlooking his fingerprints. He's putting his claws in things. And we're saying, oh, it's no big deal. It's not hurting anybody. It's no, everybody does it. Well, see, that's how Satan moves throughout the earth. That's why no one can really see him. Why? Because he always starts with one fingernail, then two fingernails. Before you know it, he's got his claw in there. Then his arm comes up. When he's embedded, he takes over. It's too late. That's when people wake up and go, oh, we lost everything. Just like this election. Uh, somebody said yesterday, how did we get, how did we get this far? everything, everybody thought it was insignificant in the beginning. Didn't they? These insignificant things is Satan's method of locomotion. That's how he moves around. That's how he does things. 
just like addictions we talked about yesterday. No one says, hey, oh, I'm going to grow up and be addicted to Percocet. Nobody does that. No, they have an accident. They have an injury. The doctor says, hey, take this Percocet. Even the doctor didn't know what the long-term effects were. They knew it could be addictive if the, if the person stayed on it for 10 years or something like that, right? So they issue that prescription. The person takes it. But the person says, oh, I still got pain, you know. And so that one, you know, that two-week prescription turns into four weeks. And before you know it, they've taken it. When they run out, they can't they operate socially awkward. And they say, I think I need just one more. Well, that just one more keeps going on until a year is up. Now the person's addicted. Now they can't do without it. Now they have a chemical dependency. Now they're going to go through withdrawals when they come off that stuff. So they can't come off. So they end up conforming to programs that just manage the addiction. No one starts out saying, that's what I want to be like. No one does that. It always starts in the realm of honesty, of innocence, but then Satan's fingernail is Satan's fingernail, despite what people think, right? And it grows and it gets bigger. These tiny, insignificant things, we should not look over. We should always pray, catch them where they are, involve the Lord in everything we can. When we have a real concern about things, and I have a real concern about things, and, and convictions that are foolish to most people, not to me. My whole life was upended by insignificant things. I know how Satan works. And I do not desire him to get a hold of anybody else that way. I don't. Anyway. Anybody anybody have a... Uh, it, it is it's closed, guys. It's, it's uh, 13 after. Somebody said, that's my pencils. I have erasers. Anybody have one of those? Somebody give me one of those. Uh, uh oh, somebody said, let's see. Mike, have a question. Would Jesus say, uh oh, here's one. Let's see. Would Jesus have known those who ended up falling away from the faith if there is true danger that a Christian can actually fall away or else if people that go to hell? Jesus says, turn away and never do it. Would it mean that all Christians can't fall away and lose their salvation? Well, think of this. If God put a child on this earth and that child had a seed of light within him, okay, and God put another child on the earth, but that child had something else within him. Now, both have a choice. There are two different seeds, but both have a choice. So God puts them in the exact same process. Right? So when the righteous child goes forward and makes a mistake or does something in this, that, and the other, right? When that child has conviction in all these different things, they're going to begin to identify with this unlikable sensation they have within them. Why? If they're born of righteousness, they will not continue to do unrighteous things. They won't. It's not that God, God is fair. That's why he put both of them in the exact same process. Now, follow me through this now. That unrighteous child, that unrighteous child may start out righteous. He may start out in the church. The problem is he's going to be called to dark things. And he's going to find himself enjoying those dark things. They grow. They grow and grow. Both make mistakes. Both do good things. Both do bad things. Right? But in the end, in the end, through everything they went through, the righteous child will be, he'll identify with righteous things and desire righteous things. He will have slowly moved away from all the darkness he can because he, it does not, doesn't associate with him. He didn't like it. So he's becoming what he truly is. Now the other child starts moving away from righteous things. He'll say, oh, I can't tolerate the church anymore. I can't tolerate these holy people anymore. I've got to go to a bar. i got to let loose. I need a vacation. I need They'll come up with an excuse to do it all. So they eventually come what they are. They went through the same process. But it just so happens in this process, people are becoming what they truly are. Right? They really can't see the process, but they're becoming what they truly are. Now, listen to me. 
If God is just, he'll have a penalty upon both of them. So whatever penalty applies to the darkness is going to apply to the other one too because God has no respect for persons. Which means if this righteous child who is indeed righteous, if he ever turns over fully to darkness, he will be condemned no matter what his origins are. That's a just God. Hmm? So there always has to be a penalty over all. And there also has to be a blessing over all. And it's up, with, up to them to choose. But in this process, whoever is truly righteous will be righteous in the end. Can the righteous fall away? Yes, they sure can. Can the unrighteous seek another path? Sure they can. Nothing is stopping them. But what ends up happening? They both become what they truly are on the inside. So the inside becomes just like the outside, and the outside like the inside. That's why Jesus said, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So what do we have here? We have people growing into what they really are. That's why the Lord said, Don't judge anybody. Why? Because they're both hidden to each other. What you may think, you may point at a person and say, well, that person's a devil, and they could actually be the righteous. You may look at another person and say, that person is fully righteous, and they could be the devil. You don't know until this process is complete. You don't know. That's why the angels harvest at the order of the living God, not at the order of mankind. That's why only at the end, are they separated when they're fully grown? Because when something is fully grown, it bears the true fruit. And when it bears that true fruit, there's the identification. So what will the righteous do? They're going to call upon the name of the Lord for real. What will the unrighteous do? What are they going to do? They're going to mock, curse, and scoff the name of the Lord for real. What did God say he would do? He would send the angels to separate both. He will separate both. He said the tares are going to be gathered together first. They're going to be gathered together first. How so? The kingdom of the beast. Can't you see it? That's why. The kingdom of God does not come first. The kingdom, this dark kingdom comes first. And everybody who loves that darkness is going to run to it. Everybody who loves pride is going to run to it. Everybody who loves judgment is going to run to it. Everybody who loves all this wickedness is going to run to it. We know that because God said he would get them all together and burn them, didn't he? What did he say in Revelation about the kingdom of the beast? He already told you what he's going to do with it. He already told you what it's going to suffer. Once everybody is marked by that kingdom, there'll be no escape. They're bound together by what the mark, by the number of his name, by all this stuff. So they're going to be together. Now, about the falling away. What is that falling away? He said, that day shall not come, that shall come a falling away first, and that manifestation be revealed. The people who fall away are the ones who separate themselves from the faith. They no longer are of the faith. So that means what? That means both are mature. That's what it means. Do you know what's happening to humanity right now? Something that's unavoidable. Maturity of a species does not happen in one generation or two or three or four. No. It happens when they go through many different generations and they advance themselves to a point Every time they hit a certain point in that notable generation where they're dissatisfied with everything old and they see no prospects for anything new, they totally change and alter. It's the birthing generation and it happens every so many generations. It's kind of like us. We started out with horses, right? We did. And we became advanced. We're flying around with boats and everything else, and our knowledge has increased big time. But what's happening right now? What's happening? We, for the last 50 years, we've hunted for new knowledge and found a lot. Now, that knowledge is available, but we find it's saying the same things. So what are people, what have people started doing? 
They have begun to invent things that are not boring. It happens every single time we hit this point in development. Every single time men are flying. Every single time that they can swim under the sea like fish. Every single time that they start swapping genders. We hit the same point of maturity. And at this point of maturity, people are not ashamed of what they really are inside. They begin to act on desires. All things become permissible. It becomes a twisted and wicked time indeed. And everybody is doing everything in the middle of technological advances right before everything goes kaput. And it just so happens that this maturity of mankind lines up with existence and the great cycles that take place. A great cycle will affect this earth like nothing no one has ever seen before. Many parts of it are already visible. They have already gotten rid of the serious people that would ever run these countries. Something different is happening on the earth. They are securing themselves, but you will not be secured. Everybody else is inventing interesting things that they can sink their mind into because what? Listen, here it is. Here's what marks that generation. The birthing generation. You ready? Here it is. Boredom. Boredom. And when people are bored, what do they begin to do? They begin to invent everything, don't they? Don't they? We have technology. We have books. We have everything that was the mandate. And it's boring. So through entertainment, through going off the cliff in many different ways, many different moral things in life, that's what people are doing. I bet you guys sit at home and you the first thing you have to fight with this boredom. I'm bored. I'm bored. I have nothing to do. I'm bored. People can say all they want to say. But I know that sometimes when you open the Word of God, you'll say, I read this before. Let me go to YouTube and hear what this guy said about the aliens with the right foot that fell off on planet lasagna and pork and beans. Then we start to entertain ideas. Well, hmm, spirits. Why in Rome did the knowledge of spirits go around and match the knowledge of spirits today? In Rome, they were saying that spirits left energy. That spirits needed energy to move things. They said the same dumb things we say today. All of a sudden, people became, they became experts on spirits. Why, why does that always happen? They become experts on spirits. They start to think their loved ones are in their homes. You start to hear people say, well, you got to clean this house because somebody died in this house and you really have to just go over this house and clean it out because they say, you know, it's a, the, so the person can't rest. The same dumb things go around. Just like now. Ghost hunting. Do you not know that was popular in Rome? Do you not know that? It was popular in Egypt. Do you not know that? It was popular in Babylon. Do you not know that? The same exact things. These are the patterns of history that continue to repeat themselves. And here we are again doing the same exact dumb things. And people are saying they're coming to the exact same conclusions with cryptids and ghosts and goblins and methods to do things with spirits. You name it, they're doing it. And it always happens right before the great destruction. And we're right here again, except this time. Instead of the smaller seasons of the cycles of men, we're at the final season of man before his absolute transformation. This is unlike any of the other ones. Now, people are going to begin to walk with manifest things right here on the earth. They're going to fully believe in what they see with their eyes. But it just so happens what they see with their eyes will not even be the truth. They'll not escape the delusion that's just for them. And if you do not love the truth, you will be given over to a strong delusion. Because the only way to see even right now is to love the truth. When you love the truth, you'll accept no substitutes. You don't want someone to come in and give you the instead of. Nope, you want the truth. You want the relationship with Christ. You do not want any other relationship with any other thing other than Christ.
You want the real deal. You're not going to settle for interpretations. You want the spiritual knowledge of Christ. You want the Holy Ghost that is unified in its voice. You not believe in a thousand interpretations of one scripture. You'll look for the one, the truth, from the Holy Spirit. You'll find quickly you cannot get the truth from mankind. They make up too much stuff, especially in, especially in these days. Here we, we're right here in these days again. Again, we're back in these days. And the patterns are going to be just like the days of old. There's but one ark. That ark is going to be based upon your love of the truth. Because if you love the truth, then you love your Lord. And you'll know that that truth is only in the Lord. These kingdoms have set up alternatives for all points of faith. And you have a choice to take the alternative, the thing that looks like it could be righteous, or you can have what is righteous. That's up to you. That's your choice. Yours. But here we are. It's back again. So don't be surprised if little kids are born with full knowledge of some sort of previous life so people start believing in reincarnation. Don't be shocked when a kid shows up that's about three years old and can name every element of Gone with the Wind or something like that. Don't be shocked if a little kid is rubbing their mommy on the chin and the baby is only a year old. And the child says, while the mom is humming a song, the child says, I used to hum that song to you when you were the baby. And I was the mother. Don't be surprised at these things. Don't be surprised. They will take place. They will take place. And the more you look into those things, the more you're going to be prone to believe in them because nothing will tell you it's not going to be a lie. It's not. It will be a well-crafted thing, but it will not be high. Many will believe in those things. I tell you, all of them are weapons. All of them. Let me tell you, let me say it again. If you do not love the truth of your Lord and Savior, you will begin to operate by the truth presented to you by the world. Only by loving the truth Will you not give in to those things of the world? See, right now, if a person came up that was a, that looked just like my grandfather or something like that, and they manifest and said, well, I'm back, and indeed it was him, and it matches the pictures, and he knows everything about everything in the past and this and the other, guess what? I'm not falling for it. Even if it's in front of my face, I'm not falling for it. See, as it turns out with me, Seeing is not believing. Seeing is deceiving, but it's not believing. My belief is based on what nobody in this world convinced me to have. And that's what I was born with. And you know what I was born with? An identification with Christ Jesus. I know and I knew he was real. I understood parts of his word before I could read the first place. Man did not give that to me. I was born with that. I've seen many truths in the world. But there's no truth like the truth of the Holy Spirit. There's no pride in the truth it would give anybody. Somebody says, but do you believe your dreams? No, I do not believe my dreams. Internal confirmation is not the dream. A dream is a dream. Internal confirmation is part of who you are. I remember times when I was a baby. I remember conversations with my parents when I was a baby, and I still believed then. I knew there was a God. I knew there was a Christ. No one ever had to teach that to me. No one. See, when we grow, it is man who convinces us. 
to interpret what we already believe in different ways. Don't you know that? You knew about Christ. You knew about God. It was man who tried to sculpt how you believed. But make no mistake, you already knew. That's why when you read the Word of God on your own, by yourself, and you read something, you said, you said to yourself, all of you said to yourself, all of you who believe, you said this to yourself, you said, amen, that's what I thought all along. And they tried to convince me it was different from this. I knew this first. That's what you find in the Word of God. You, you know things in the Word of God nobody ever taught you. Things that are in you, you'll know that nobody ever taught you. And when you see them in the Word of God, that's when you distinguish. Wait a minute. People tried to interpret this to me differently. I should have kept my original belief. Man did not give you that original belief. You were born with it. That's internal confirmation. That's not a dream. That's, in, that's why I tell you guys I don't believe. Listen, a dream is a dream. It's a dream. Or gives you something though. It's different. When you lay down in the bed and go to sleep, and you still you wake up, you've seen things. That's a dream. But I, I challenge you on something. Suppose you you didn't lay down. Suppose you went to go sit down in a chair, and lots of people are around you, and then all of a sudden you look to your left, and nobody is there, and it's nighttime, but you're in that chair, and nobody ever explains to you what the world happened to you. Okay, that wasn't a dream. No, it wasn't. Suppose you're on your feet, and it's the afternoon. Hmm? Then all of a sudden you come to yourself after going through a, an experience, and you almost fall over, but you're still standing up, and everybody's still around you, and no time has passed. Yet you spend about two weeks in some sort of a something. That's not a dream either, is it? When you lay down in the bed and you drift off to sleep or you're sitting at your desk and you drool on your keyboard, that's a dream. But when you feel like you're flying in a million different directions and it scares the peanuts out of your M&Ms and something different than a dream happens because there is no missing anything, that's not a dream. That's a scary thing. When your soul freezes up, you know, it's one thing for your body to freeze up, but I'm talking about your soul freezing up. That's the difference. Some of you guys have felt some of this. See, some of you, you were about to lay down in your bed, and you felt yourself drifting. And it felt like if you drifted any further, you would never come back. Some of you know exactly what that is. You know precisely what that is. And what did you do? You wrestled to not go deeper into that whatever it was. And it disturbed you. See, some of you know what it is. To be all by yourself. And you're thinking about something, you're not sleeping, then everything changes. You guys know things, you just haven't put it together yet because you don't communicate with each other enough. And there are too many experts that wrote books about their interpretation of what they think truth is. They have deluded or attempt to delude. Satan will always do this. He will always, before the Lord does something, he will present the interpretation of things before the Lord discloses it to you so that if you ever look in that direction, it causes instant confusion about what happened to you. That's why you have some ancient text just to confuse the origins. That's what they're there for. That's why in the Bible when it says when Satan speaks a lie, he speaks of himself, of his own, of what he did a long time ago. He planted those seeds a long time ago to confuse you today. He had things buried a long time ago so they would dig them up today. Satan is the author of confusion, not our father. There is no confusion in what the Holy Spirit gives. There is no confusion in what our Lord departed to us. There is always confusion with Satan. Before Jesus came to this earth, 
he sent the story of a virgin birth. He tried to send everything prior to it happening here on earth. He sent the counterfeit first. The people you meet in your life, you met the counterfeit first, didn't you? You can't deny that. Counterfeits always come first. God requires patience, not Satan. He sends you the, the counterfeit. And if you fall for it, you're stuck like Chuck. You'll think it's a real thing. It'll look like the real thing. It'll smell like the real thing. Act like the real thing. And, and indeed, it is the real thing. But it required no patience. So how can it be from your Father in heaven? Be careful of quickly answered prayers. I don't want a prayer that's answered right away because my Father requires patience. Be wary of other methods that do not require patience. When you know your Father requires patience, these are qualifiers. Satan can't do anything about that. But if you would open your eyes, you would see his ploys everywhere. He's trying to get you into an area where you're totally confused and end up against Yahshua HaMashiach. Well, okay, I'm going to have to let you guys go. Listen, God bless each and every one of you. I'm going to see you guys again. Tomorrow is what? What is tomorrow? Tomorrow's Thursday, it's Pastor Paul. But I may pop on a little before that. Geoactivity is off the scale on this planet. It requires some uh, tracking. How about that plus in the United States? I hope that people are prepared. I really do hope they are, especially you guys in America. And the UK, you guys have been you guys have been blessed for a while. I, but just your 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 moment of trying is is here. And I pray that people are uh, really getting prepared for that. Now, nobody be surprised if the stories of water start to flood your local areas. And what I mean by waters, I mean contaminates in your waters. Smells in the water that's not right. These days require vigilance. The enemy is at the, in the gate. The enemy is already in the gate. And you better believe they're going to attempt to hit us where it counts. They will. And they're doing things. But be aware of that. Please don't uh, think these are, you know, ordinary days. They are not. They're not. God bless each of you. Hope I didn't ramble too much tonight. I hope I did. You guys are a true blessing. And thank you, Angela, Ring of Fire, for visiting us. Uh, uh, Ring of Fire, by the way, is supposed to so give me some questions. Um, so I can, because Angela always, she gets, some, she gets some pretty good, she gets really good questions. And she's going to give us some questions so we can start going over those things. I think it'll be a good thing. It'll be a real good thing. So hopefully she gets those to us quick. She probably already did, and I didn't check the mail yet. But um, we'll check up on those things and see. It'll be a good thing. God bless you guys. I'm going to see you next time right here at the Council of Time. God bless and keep all of you always. See you next time right here. God bless.